So this is dog sentient nature and it's in wonders. We wanted to do it in November, so we do it now. <clears throat> Silence isn't empty, it is full of answers, is a Buddhist axiom. As there is sound in nature which is inaudible, so there is color which is invisible, but which can be heard. The creative force at work in its incessant task of transformation produces color, sound and numbers in the shape of rates of vibration, which compound and dissociate the atoms and molecules. Though invisible and inaudible to us in detail, yet the synthesis of the whole becomes audible to us on the material plane. It is that which a Chinese call the great tone or kung. It is, even by scientific confession, the actual tonic of nature, held by a musician to be the middle far of the keyboard of the piano. We hear distinctly in the voice of nature, in the roaring of the ocean, in the sound of the foliage of a great forest, in the distant roar of a great city, in the wind, the tempest and the storm. In short, in everything in nature which has a voice to produce sound. To the hearing of all who hearken, it culminates in a single definite tone of an unappreciable pitch, which is, as said, is F or far on the diatonic scale. When sound waves move through the air, each air molecule vibrates back and forth, hitting the air molecule next to it which then also vibrates back and forth. When these vibrations are fast or high frequency, we hear a high note. When vibrations are slower, we hear a lower note. Sounds affect our bodies, minds and spirit in many different dimensions. The vibration of singing bowls, for example, project unto and into the human body through air or dire contact promote a state of natural equilibrium called homeostasis, neutralizing any physical or emotional strains. At one frequency, the sound waves may feel like raindrops falling on your, on your hand. At a high frequency, they may feel like foam. The amplitude measures how compression the wave are compared to the air around them. In addition to hearing sound waves, you can also sometimes feel them. If you stand in front of a loudspeaker at a rock concert, you will definitely be able to feel the pulsating sensation of the sound waves as they hit your body. Unlike waves on a lake, sound waves don't really travel up and down. Instead, they are more like layers of high and low pressure, traveling outward in all directions. Each wave consists of a layer of high pressure, followed by a layer of low pressure. The bigger the difference between the high pressure and the lower pressure, the louder the sound. But sound waves don't just travel in air. They travel through whatever they encounter, including your body. So when you listen to loud music, your whole body alternates between high and low pressure, like the air around it. It is well known that by using sound, we can transmit data. Everything from bird chirps to human language can be considered as a form of data over sound. Does that also apply to the plant kingdom? Are plants really silent or do they communicate among themselves and even with humans by sound vibration? Do they have feelings and intelligence and can they even form images of, of their surroundings? Theosophy teaches that the different vibrations, variations of plants are the broken rays of one ray. As the ray passes through the seven planes, it is broken on every plane into thousands and millions of rain, rays 
down to the world of forms, every ray breaking into an intelligence on its own plane, so that we see every plant has an intelligence or its own purpose of life, so to speak, and its own free will to a degree. This is how I, at any rate, understand it, says HPB. A plant can be receptive or non-receptive. So every plant, without an exception, feels and has a consciousness of its own. If plants are conscious, can they communicate? And how would they be able to do it? Dr. Monica Gagliano was a marine animal ecologist, spending her professional life in the waters of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, studying at one time the private life and reproductive output of a little damselfish called Ambon. Just after the week in the vicinity, they knew her and snuggled comfortably inside her open hand and her fingers gently curled around their scaly bodies and then opened again. Today, she vividly remembers the last day of her studies when she went into the water to say goodbye to them before returning in the afternoon to capture some and according to scientific protocol, kill them for studies in a laboratory. A chilly sensation filled her when none of them was in sight when she returned in the afternoon, let alone approach her. At that moment, she knew that they knew. She suddenly felt the blood of all past killings she had done in the name of science, and a dreadful feeling of guilt flooded her heart. And she knew instantly that she would never be able to kill again, that there was no scientific question significant enough that could justify the killing of another living being. She also immediately realized that she would be impossible to continue her scientific research without slaughter. And her career as an animal scientist ended right there and then. And a new vocation as a plant scientist was about to start. In 1913, Dr. Gagliano moved to the laboratory of Professor Stefano Mancuso, a leading authority in the field of plant neurobiology at the University of Florence in Italy. As a signaling and communication at all levels of biological organization is explored. The purpose of her visit was to deepen her knowledge about the behavior of the plant world. After lengthy discussions, they agreed on one experiment to prove what many had believed for some time, that plants are equipped with an effective memory. The chosen plant for this experiment was a very sensitive Mimosa prudica a creeping perennial flowering plant often grown for its curiosity value because its leaves fold inward and droop when touched or shaken, defending itself from harm, reopening again a few minutes later when realizing that there was no immediate danger. For her experiment, Dr. Gagliano put several of these plants into jars and dropped them from a height of about four inches onto a soft ground. The result was immediately exciting. The leaves folded inwards and drooped almost instantaneously. But after a series of repetitions, about seven or eight, the plants stopped closing their leaves, ignoring every subsequent fall. Dr. Gagliano and her colleagues had to find out now if that was simply due to fatigue or if the plants had understood that there was nothing to fear from the drop. In the next experiment, the plants were shaken horizontally and they immediately responded to the new stimulus in their own way, closing and drooping their leaves. They had obviously recognized the shift in motion which was unfamiliar. The next step was to find out how long the memory of that drop dropping experience as not being dangerous would last. 
Being left undisturbed for a while, the experiment was periodically repeated and the result exceeded all expectations. Mimosa Pudica remembered for more than 40 days, a very long time compared with the standard memory span of many insects and several other superior animals confirmed the scientists. In his book, The Evolutionary Genius of Plants, A New Understanding of Plant Intelligence and Behavior, Dr. Stefano Mancuso also described the amazing mimicry ability of plants, often surpassing those of animals, to allow their survival in the surrounding environment, the ability of exchanging information, and that they even have some kind of visual capacity due to the cells of the epidermis. Very often the epidermis of a plant is convex like a lens and could conceivably convey the images of surrounding plants to the underlying cellular labor. The most talented plant in mimicry seems to be the vine Opila trifoliata, growing in the rainforest of Chile and Argentina which acts almost like a chameleon by sh shape-shifting the form of its leaves to match its surroundings, hiding from predators. But that is not all. The structure of certain plants also inspired architects. The most famous example is Crystal Palace. In 1851, the first great exhibition was planned in London. To host it properly, a colossal structure had to be built inside Hyde Park, suitable for welcoming delegates from around the world, as well as millions of spectators, reflecting the greatness of the British Empire. Since it was not supposed to be a permanent structure, it had to be built quickly, functional, and with minimal expense. Students of architecture across Europe took part in the competition. The omission received 245 proposals and after a long process of analysis rejected them all, which was unexpected. The evaluation had taken a lot of time and there were only a few months left to host the great exhibition and Great Britain ran the risk of a sensational embarrassment before the whole world. In this tense atmosphere, Joseph Paxton, the head gardener of William Cavendish, sixth Duke of Devonshire, came to the rescue. He had the revolutionary idea of building a huge glass and cast iron structure using prefabricated units. British technology had already evolved sufficiently at that time to make rapid production of tens of thousands units possible. Thus, by gradually adding new elements, the initial structure could be extended to infinity. If the whole thing would be dismantled again at the end of the exhibition, the various parts could easily be put together for another use. It was in effect a colossal erection of a greenhouse which Paxton had already designed on a smaller scale to protect exotic plants against the cold British weather. But a building of this enormous size had to be complied with strict structural requirements. And in addition, it had to be completed on schedule and at low cost. And that is where Paxton's second ingenious intuition came in, due to his extraordinary passion for botany to mimic the narration of the Victoria Amazonica, leaves to create large arched, arched walls. Victoria Amazonica is the largest of the water lily family, a national flower of Guyana and tropical South America. Its very large green leaves lie flat on the water surface with ridged edges and then grow up to three meters in diameter on a stalk up to eight meters in length. If properly distributed, a leaf can withstand a load of nearly a hundred pounds without breaking or deforming. 
because on its underside, it is equipped with spines which serve as a protection against large aquatic herbivorous marine mammals. Paxton designed a design of enormous dimensions according to the radical structure of the Victoria Amazonica made it possible to complete the building in just four months. And London was ready to host the great exhibition with pomp and grandeur and left more than 14,000 exhibitor, exhibitors from all over the world, as well as 5 million visitors speechless. Among them, Charles Darwin, Charles Dickens, Charlotte Bronte, George Eliot, and Alfred Tennyson. The proceeds of the ticket sale were used for the construction of the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Science Museum, and the National History Museum, thanks to the Victoria Amazonica, and Paxton was made a baronet. HBB says, as the soul of the world permeates the whole cosmos, even beasts must have in them something divine, said Clement for Alexandria in the Stromata. This is also the doctrine of Buddhists and the Hermeticists, that Manu endows with the living soul even the plants and the tiniest blade of grass. So who is Manu? Is it possible to say that Manu is an individuality? HPB was asked by a student. And the answer, answer was, in an abstract sense, certainly not. But it is possible to apply an analogy. Manu is the synthesis purpose of the Manasa or Manasa Putra, sons of mind, whose collectivity is the eternal mind. And he is a single consciousness in the same sense that while all the different cells of which the human body is composed are different and of varying consciousnesses, there is still a unit of consciousness which is a man. But this unit, so to say, is not a single consciousness. It is a reflection of thousands and millions of consciousnesses which a man has absorbed. Mano is not really an individuality, it is a whole of mankind. The hidden world of brotherhood in the plant kingdom is also thoroughly investigated by the German forester Peter Wohlleben in his book, The Hidden Life of Trees, where he wrote that trees in a forest act as a unity, feeling and protecting each other from the extremes of weather and pests. They can store plenty of water to keep the environment moist, which a single tree on its own could never achieve. Even sick or injured trees are supported in this way, helping them with their recovery. Trees communicate and care for each other in several different ways, by smell, for example. For decades ago in the savannah of Africa, it was discovered that umbrella acacias do not like to be eaten at all by giraffes. And not only do they produce within minutes toxins in their leaves, but also extrude a gas, ethylene in this case, to warn their neighbors. Giraffes know this and avoid all the trees within an area of about 100 meters. That is how far the smell can be distributed before they start eating again beyond the distance. Or they proceed with their aim against the wind. Trees do not only spread the perfumes for warning reasons, Combined with the color of their blossoms, they attract the bees to the nectar, which cause a much needed pollination at the same time. They can even discern the saliva from different insects that feed on their leaves and produce a smell that attracts specific enemies that feed on these plagues. Oaks, on the other hand, guide bitter and poisonous tannic acid into their bark and leaves which either kills the insects or cause a bitter and unpleasant taste to chase their tormentors away. Warning messages are also sent via the root system, about one centimeter per second. Since this is not very fast, trees make the best use of fungi 
as transmitters as well. The thin threads penetrating the ground act similar to the fiberglass connection of the internet, says William. One teaspoon of forest soil contains many meters of these hyphens. Just one fungi can develop over a few centuries a network that spreads through the whole forest. But this is not all. Trees and other plants can even communicate via electrical impulses through a kind of nerve cells at the tips of their roots. Dr. Gagliano from the University of Western Australia, whom we have mentioned before, and her colleagues tested the soil of different sprouts and could very soon register a faint noise coming from their roots at a frequency of 220 hertz. The roots of the other sprouts that were not immediately involved in the test responded promptly, turning their tips into the very direction as if they could hear this sound vibration. Science is already talking about a wood white web that penetrates our forest, says William. In a book, Thus Spoke the Plant, Dr. Gagliano describes how she learned to communicate with plants by shamanic methods on an ultrasonic level. Her university had organized a series of workshops to assist researchers like her. A wide range of applicants were asked to write a succinct one paragraph summary of their field of investigation, which could be comprehensively comprehensible to non-specialists. This summary would be read to the group to provide feedback and comments. <clears throat> when Dr. Gagliano's research officer heard that she was going to write a proposal on understanding sound communications in plants, she was told that this was nothing other than career suicide. But her determination was unshaken because what she was about to present had its foundation in personal experience. It was not a theoretical speculation. When it was her turn to speak, she was met with a scornful remark from one of her colleagues. Is this a joke? That is not science. With great arrogance, he expressed his mockery bluntly. And Monica knew that he was not alone with his opinion although others seem to prefer to be silenced. But then the unexpected happened. It was one of her friends who found out about the amazing news first and had sent her an email with a link to the Australian Research Council funding, where she had just been awarded a three-year research fellowship for the plant investigation. She was overwhelmed and in total disbelief, mixed with gratitude. Today, Dr. Monica Gagliano is a leading expert in the realm of bioacoustics, research associate professor in evolutionary ecology at the Biological Intelligence Laboratory, Southern Cross University, a research associate professor at University of Western Australia, and research affiliate at the Sydney Environment Institute, University of Sydney. Plant bioacoustics is still a newly emerging field of plant communication. Plants produce sound waves in the lower end of the audio range, as well as an overabundance of ultrasonic sounds, says Dr. Gagliano. By capturing the signals emitted by plants under different environmental conditions, I am exploring the ecological significance of these sounds to communication among plants and between plants and other organisms. The result from our investigation in bioacoustics is now well confirmed by other research centers like the Tel Aviv University in Israel. In times of intense stress, people sometimes let out their fear with a sequel of screams or noises. And a new study suggests that plants might do the same. 
A team of scientists placed microphones near stressed tomato and tobacco plants. The instruments picked up the crop's ultrasonic sequel, sequel from about four inches, 10 centimeters away. The noises fell within a range of 20 to 100 kilohertz, a volume that could feasibly be detected by some organisms from up to several meters away. Under stress, tomatoes and tobacco plants, when deprived of water, for example, or if their stems are being cut, send out sound vibrations. The recordings of their response with the microphone showed that in both cases, the plants began to emit ultrasonic sounds, which can convey the distress to other plants and organisms in immediate vicinity. Plants that had no immediate environmental threat or damage released less than one ultrasound per hour. <clears throat> Ultrasonic sound waves have frequencies higher than the upper audible limit of human beings. Ultrasound is not different from normal sound in its physical properties, except that humans cannot hear it. This limit varies from person to person and is approximately 10 kilohertz in healthy young adults. Dr. Gagliano believes, like many scientists and environmentalists do, that in order to save the plant, we have to understand ourselves as part of the natural world. It's just that we also believe the plants themselves can speak to this point. And she wrote, Origam means, thank you for listening in the language of the plants. It is not a word as we humans understand it, because its meaning cannot be spoken, nor can it be heard. However, we can experience it by feeling with our bodies and listening to what our ears cannot hear. When we learn to listen to plants without the need to hear them speak, a language that we have forgotten emerges. It is a language beyond words, one that does not wonder or pretend to mislead. It is a language that conveys its rich and meaningful expression by bypassing the household of the mind, directly connecting one spirit to another. I want people to realize that the world is full of magic, but not as something only some people can do or something that is outside of this world, she said. No, it's all here. As environmental collapse looms, we have never known so much about life on Earth, how extraordinary and intricate it all is, and how loose the boundary where it ends and we begins, she says. In summer 2019, Dr. Gagliano said on a sold out panel called Intelligence Without Brains at the World Science Festival. She spoke about plants with pointless familiarity. In her telling, they became jaunty little characters. She used the pronouns like he and they, never it. A young woman asked Dr. Gagliano how her scientific words had changed the understanding of the world. And she answered, the main difference is that I used to live in a world of objects. And now I live in a world of subjects. There were murmurs of approval. And so I'm never alone. That was an interview in the New York Times. Whatever quits, quits the liar or homogeneous latent state becomes active conscious life. Individual consciousness emanates from and returns to absolute consciousness, which is eternal motion, says an esoteric axiom. In a great article, Psychic and Heretic Action, first published in Lucifer, volume 7 in October 1890, HPB gives a very detailed outline of the two different aspects of consciousness, where she confirms that every phenomenon in the visible universe has its genesis in cosmic motion, which is called the Great Breath and the Secret Doctrine, producing sound at the same time. Beginningless and endless, 
or the eternal life, the basis and genesis of the subjective and objective universe, of which molecular motion is the lowest and most material of its infinite manifestation. Occultism regards every atom of an independent entity and every cell as a conscious unit. As soon as atoms group to form cells, the latter will become endowed with consciousness of its own kind, and that memory has its seed in every organ of the body. So when that's consciousness of its own start. In 1973, the Norwegian philosopher and mountaineer Arne Ness introduced the phrase deep ecology to environmental literature. This term considers the world as an integrated whole rather than a dissociated collection of parts and recognizes the fundamental interdependence of all phenomena. Regarding human life as just one of many components of a global ecosystem. It is a system's view about interconnections and relationships with all forms of life, seeing the world as a living network and not as a machine. Scientists have concluded that prokaryotes, a combination of two Greek words, pro before and carrion, not a kernel, a single celled life forms without a nucleus to contain the DNA, like a bacterial cell. They preceded the more complex eukaryotes, a Greek term for two nucleus, which are found in the cells of plants, animals, and fungi. These challenging questions were studied and addressed by the two Chilean scientists, Dr. Umberto Maturana and Dr. Francisco Varela. They coined a new word for what defines a living or vital system, autopoiesis, a combination of the two Greek terms auto, which means self, referring to the autonomy of a self-organizing system, and poiesis, sharing the same Greek root as the word poetry, which means making. Autopoiesis therefore means self-making, a peculiar closure of living systems which are alive and maintain themselves metabolically, whether they succeed in reproduction or not. Unlike machines whose governing functions are embedded by human designers, organisms, on the other hand, are self-governing. Autopoetic emphasizes life's maintenance of its own identity, its cybernetic self-relatedness, and its ability to make more of itself. Cybernetic is a science of communication and automatic control of systems. Living beings maintain their form by the continuous interchange and flow of chemical components. Cellular autopoietic systems are bounded by a dynamic material which is made by the system itself. All life on Earth is autopoietic system need a supply of water in its liquid state or self-maintenance of their parts requiring carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. The smallest autopoietic system on Earth is a living bacteria, is a living bacterial cell. Viruses, for example, do not even in principle behave as an autopoietic system. They require cells to live in and for their continuity and duplication to metabolize and survive. <laughs> the pattern of organization of a living system is always the network pattern. The key characteristics of a net living network is that it continually produces itself. An autopoetic network creates its own boundary, which defines the cell as a distinct system while being an active part of the network. It is open to the flow of energy. Its order and behavior are not imposed by the environment, but are established by the system itself. Through their interaction with the environment, living organisms continually main and renew themselves, using energy and resources from the environment 
for that purpose. The continual self-making includes the ability to form new structures and new patterns of behavior. If these processes stop, so does the entire organization. <clears throat> and as we have heard before, this is a fundamental axiom of occultism, which regards every atom of an independent entity and every cell as a conscious unit. It explains that no sooner do atoms group to form cells than the latter become endowed with consciousness, each of his own kind, and with free will to act within the limits of law. Every cell in the human body, as in every animal, is endowed with its own peculiar discrimination, instinct, and speaking relatively with intelligence, says SPB. Dr. Maturana's and Dr. Varela's concept of what the nature of life and cognition is, is was later called Santiago theory. According to this theory, the brain is not necessary to exist. A bacterium or a plant has no brain, but it has a mind. The Santiago theory provides a coherent scientific framework that mind and matter no longer appear as two separate categories but are seen as merely different aspects or dimensions of the same phenomenon of life. And as we have quoted before, as the soul of the world permeates the whole cosmos, even beasts must have in them something divine. Manu endows with a living soul, even the plants and the tiniest blades of grass, such as Bibi. And in Isis and Rage goes on saying that plants have mystical properties in a most wonderful degree, and that most of this wisdom is now lost to European science. But this has changed dramatically over the last centuries. Since the early days of biolo biolo biology, philosophers and scientists have noticed that living forms mysteriously mysteriously combines the stability of structure with the fluidity of change. They depend on a constant flow of matter through them, or transform the material on which they feed to maintain their activities to grow, develop, reproduce, and evolve. Being open systems, all organisms in an ecosystem produced waste. But what is waste for one species is food for another. Wastes are continually recycled so that the ecosystem as a whole remains without waves. HBB says something similar in her article, The Fall of Ideas, that the protein or ever-changing part of nature around man, where every particle is incessantly transformed, the harmonious body still remains. An analogy could be the word forest. The word forest is singular, yet it is a term to express the idea of thousands or even millions of trees of different kinds. So in Greek mythology, where the whole earth is described as a living interdependent organism called Gaia, which the atmospheric scientist James Lovelock brought into focus again. Lovelock was invited by NASA to help them design instruments for the detection of life on Mars. Space flights in the 1960s, for example, had enabled human beings for the first time to actually look at our planet from outer space, perceiving it as an integrated whole. The perception of Earth in all its beauty, a blue and white globe floating in the deep darkness of space, had moved astronauts deeply, and several have declared that it was a profound spiritual experience that forever changed the relationship to the Earth. Lovelock assumed that life on any planet would use the atmosphere and ocean as a fluid media for raw materials and waste products. Therefore, one might be able to detect the existence of life by analyzing the chemical composition of the planet's atmosphere. 
This was dramatically confirmed when he and his colleague Ian Hitchcock compared the systematic analysis of the Martian and Earth atmosphere. They were strikingly different. Today, there are no more chemical reactions on Mars. There is complete chemical equilibrium in the Martian atmosphere. On Earth, it is exactly the opposite. Its atmosphere contains gases like oxygen and methane, which are likely to react with each other due to the presence of life on Earth. Plants constantly produce oxygen and other organisms produce other gases. The atmospheric gases are continually being replenished while they undergo chemical reactions and that the self-regulating processes involve organisms in the biosphere. These feedback loops link together living and non-living systems. We can now no longer think of rocks, animals and plants as being separate. The Gaia theory shows that there is a tight interlocking between the plants, living parts and plants. Microscopy, microscopy, microorganisms and animals and its non-living parts like rock crystals, etc. According to the Gaia theory, life creates the conditions for its own existence. Life makes forms and changes the environment to which it adapts. Then that environment feeds back on the life that is changing, acting and growing in it. Lovelo came up with an ingenious mathemat mathematical model representing a very simplified Gaian system, which he called Daisy World. Daisy World is a hypothetical planet proposed by James Lovelock and Andrew Watson to illustrate the Gaia hypothesis. This hypothesis states that living organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings, creating a self-regulating system that can maintain the conditions for life on the planet. The planet's surface is comprised of white daisies and black daisies and a background. White daisies grow best in warm climate, but they reflect light and make the planet colder. On the other side, black daisies prefer cold climate, but absorb light and consequently make the planet warmer. These feedbacks of the constant cyclical interaction keeps the temperature constant even when the solar energy changes, making life possible on Earth for more than 4.6 billion years now. <clears throat> the classical theory of evolution is the idea that organisms will gradually adapt to their environment until they reach a fit that is good enough for survival and reproduction. In the new system view, by contrast, evolutionary change is seen as a result of life's inherent tendency to create novelty, which may or may not be accompanied by adaptation for changing environmental conditions. During billions of years, bacteria continually transformed the Earth's surface and atmosphere, and in doing so, invented all of life's essential biotechnologies. We are now beginning to see continual cooperation and mutual dependence among all forms of life as central aspects of evolution. The American biologist and evolutionary scientist Lynn Magulix expressed it like this. Life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. One of the first bacterial inventions was fermentation. The breaking down of sugars and conversion into ATP molecules, short for andenosine triphosphate, that are able to store and transport chemical energies within cells that fuel all cellular processes. Some of the fermenters also developed the ability to absorb nitrogen gas from the air and convert it into various organic compounds. Since nitrogen is an ingredient of the protein of all cells, 
all living organisms today depend on the nitrogen fixing bacteria for their survival. The secret doctrine describes a similar fermentation process, right? that which involves oxygen. Certain germ cells, such as those of yeast, develop and multiply in air. But when deprived of it, they will adapt themselves to life without air and become ferments, absorbing oxygen from substances coming into contact with them and thereby ruining the latter. The cells in fruit, when lacking free oxygen, act as ferments and stimulate fermentation. Therefore, the vegetable cell manifests in this case its life as an anaerobic, as its abs absence of free oxygen, being life, therefore, life therefore is everywhere in the universe. And occultism teaches that it is also in the atom. Maturanas and Varia Santiago theory is a continual bringing forth of a world through the process of living. That the process of living itself is a process of cognition, including perception, emotion, and behavior which does not necessarily require a brain and nervous system, that even bacteria perceive certain characteristics of the environment. Development is always associated with learning, the two sides of the same coin. As the complexity of a living organism increases, so does its cognitive domain. The brain and nervous system represent a significant expansion of an organism's cognitive domain. At a certain level of complexity, a living organism not only couples to its environment, but also to itself, and thus brings forth not only an external, but also an inner world. In human beings, this process of an inner world is intimately linked to language, thought, and consciousness. And as we have said before, according to the Santiago theory, cognition is not a representation of an independent world, but rather bringing forth of a world where no objectively existing structure exists independently, but are part of each other in a network of interdependence. And as we have said before, nature is trio. There's a visible objective nature, an invisible indwelling energizing nature, the exact model of the other and its vital principle. And above the two, spirit, source of all forces, alone eternal and indestructible. The lower two constantly change, the higher third does not. Everything in the universe Progress is steadily in the great cycle, while incessantly going up and down in the smaller cycles, says a secret doctrine. Nature is never stationary doing Manvantara, as it is ever becoming, not simply being. And mineral, mineral, vegetable, and human life are always adapting their organisms to the then reigning elements. And therefore, those elements are then fitted for them as I know for the life of present humanity. HPB also refers in the footnote to the German metaphysician Hegel, who also stated that nature was a perpetual becoming. It is a purely esoteric conception. In the same Gospel of Peace, Jesus said, I tell you truly, the book of nature is a holy scroll. And if you would save the sons of men, save themselves and find everlasting life, teach them how once again to read from the living pages of the earthly mother. Only when he returns to the bosom of his earthly mother will he find everlasting life and the stream of life which leads to his heavenly father. And in the voice of the silence we can read, Help nature and work with her, and nature will regard thee as one of her creators and make obeisance. 
and she will open widely before thee the portals of her secret chambers. Lay before thy gaze the treasures hidden in the very depths of her pure virgin bosom. Unsullied by the hand of matter, she shows her treasures only to the eye of spirit, the eye which never closes, the eye for which there is no veil in all her kingdom. And in the Mahatma letters we can read, Thus it is plain that the methods of occultism, though in the main unchangeable, have yet to conform to altered times and circumstances. And at the very early stages of the theosophical movement, a famous document known as the letter of the Mahachuan, head of the Transimalian mystics, was passed on to some of the principal workers of that day, which emphasizes that the doctrine we promulgate, being the only true one, must support it by such evidence as we are preparing to give become ultimately triumphant, as every other truth. Yet it is absolutely necessary to inculcate it gradually, enforcing its theory unimpeachable facts for those who know, with direct inferences deduced from and corroborated by the evidence furnished by modern exact science. And to conclude, in another Buddhist axiom it says, Life is like a book, some chapters sad, some happy, and some exciting. But if you never turn a page, you will never know what the next chapter holds. And that is it.